Welcome to Emphasis Added, a podcast brought to you by the Houston Law Review about legal issues, prominent lawyers, and the study and practice of law. I'm Harrison Little. And I'm Jake Garino, and we are your hosts for Season 5. Thank you for joining us. We're joined here today by Alamdar Hamdani, the current U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of Texas, to discuss his story and role as the Chief Federal Law Enforcement Officer for one of the most populous federal districts in the nation. Mr. Hamdani received his Bachelor of Business Administration from the University of Texas at Austin in 1993 and his Juris Doctorate from the University of Houston Law Center in 1999. After passing the bar, he worked in the firm setting and was a founding partner of Hamdani and Simon LLP. In 2008, Mr. Hamdani began his career as a public servant, working as an assistant U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of Kentucky. He later became deputy in chief of the counterterrorism section of the National Security Division at the Department of Justice. Then, in 2014, he began working as an assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Texas, where he remained until his appointment to his current role by President Biden in late 2022. Mr. Hamdani, thank you for joining us. Good to be here. Thanks, guys. Thrilled to have you. In this section, we hope to get to know you better and discuss your background and experiences that led you uh, to where you are today. So when you were 10 years old, you and your family emigrated from England to the United States, settling in Euless, Texas. How did you adapt to the sudden change of your environment, and what were some challenges and advantages that came with your move to the United States? Sure. So when I came here, I had a thick Cockney accent. I spoke too fast. Um, you know, Euless, Texas uh, wasn't really a hotbed of multiculturalism. So I was probably one of the few brown people um, in the city. Um, and, you know, my daddy was a cab driver. And so, you know, I grew up in this small two bedroom roach infested apartment uh, with my little sister. Um, and my mom and my dad. If you look at that scenario, there's a whole host of challenges. Uh, you know, you're uh, a new person in a new country. I had to make new friends. Um, I remember I made the, uh, apparently back in the day, you couldn't get your clothes from Kmart, but apparently I told some kids I got my clothes from Kmart, so that ended up being a, a social black mark on me for a while. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a story of every migrant. Um, and this is a country um, full of stories of migrants. And so it's, it's adapting to a new system. It's adapting to new friends. It's understanding a new language, even though English was my first language. You know, there's a quite a bit of difference between the American culture and the British culture. It's, you know, at the time I grew up Muslim. And so being a Muslim, um, a brown Muslim uh, in a new country uh, was also kind of, uh, difficult and interesting and and full of challenges. You know, how I got over it was understanding and appreciating that my mother and father sacrificed everything to come to the United States. And they were migrants twice over. They left India for England, right? So left their lives in India to the United Kingdom and then did it again when I was 10 going on 11 to come to America in search of the American dream. Um, and so, as kids, you understand the burden um, and the opportunity that gives you. And so, it's an incredible driving factor. So, you take all of that, uh, but also take the joy and the excitement of being in a new land. I mean, it's one thing to like go from a new city as a kid, but to go to a new country um, with this belief like, you know, one day you might, you know, do better than your parents, and that's what America is all about. America is all about the the next generation doing better than the prior. That's what America offers. It was pretty exciting. The true testament to the American dream. You know, I uh, it's nice for you to say that. I, I, uh, I, you know, have I accomplished the American dream? I don't. I really don't know what my mom and dad's dream was, um, but you know, I myself believe, yeah, I've got it. I've done it. I'm, you know, as the United States attorney, and we'll talk about my job more, but I can tell you this, this job I have, and you guys are about to go into your jobs, uh, but I can tell you, as a lawyer, this is the best job I'll ever have, hands down. Um, and, and and being in AUSA was the best job as a lawyer you could ever have. So I can't imagine how proud your family must have been to see your journey and how far you've come since arriving here. You know, uh, so unfortunately, my father passed away before I became the U.S. attorney um, in early 2021. Uh, but my mother, 
my mother is uh, incredibly proud. Um, so much so, she took my LinkedIn picture, uh, blew it up, and hung it up on the wall in the house. So there you go, because uh, it says United States Attorney on it. Right. So she was very, very excited. Um, and uh, no, it's good. I'll give you, I'll give you a, sh uh, uh, a little story. So, um, you know, I left uh, a pretty lucrative law practice uh, to become an AUSA. But more so than that, I moved cities from Houston to Kentucky to become an AUSA. Quite the change itself. Quite the change itself, right? And so I moved my family, um, and my family was a small kid, an eight-month pregnant wife, a dog and a cat from Houston, Texas, sold the house, shut down the practice, and moved to, to the Eastern District of Kentucky. Took a pay cut so I could become a federal prosecutor. So I remember... Um, you know, I am, I'm at my dinner table with my in-laws. And it's the first time they're at my dinner table um, in Kentucky. And uh, I'm telling my mother-in-law, you know, about my new job. And so she's like, you know, so she's like, yeah, yeah. She's like, um, she asked me, she goes, so how is, how is your job as, as the United States attorney? And I said, oh, mom, 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 I'm, a, I'm an assistant United States attorney. I remember she looked at me with such disappointment. She goes, oh, <laughs> you are only assistant. only assistant. The greatest thing about that story is at my investiture, I had my mother-in-law front and center when I became the U.S. attorney. So and she was incredibly proud. Uh, my family is uh, very proud, and, and, and uh, I am extremely, I feel privileged and honored to be the U.S. attorney. So moving from Houston to Kentucky, was that initially a tough sell to your wife and to the rest of your family, just yeah. to uproot yourself and move away to something completely different to be a federal prosecutor? So I'll tell you this. So I was, uh, I'll backtrack a little bit. So um, at some point I decided I wanted to become a federal prosecutor. I'd been a lawyer for about seven or eight years at that point. And I interviewed with the Houston office. My wife was okay with that because we, we won't leave. And I got one interview, but I didn't get a call back. So I then um, met a guy who was uh, the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Kentucky uh, at the time. He, his name is Amul Tapar. He's now on the Sixth Circuit. He was the first South Asian to become uh, presidentially appointed, Senate confirmed. I'm the fourth South Asian to become presidentially appointed, Senate confirmed when it comes, becomes the U.S. Attorney. Anyway, he said to me, I met him at a conference and I met him for the first time, and I told him, I think I want to become a federal prosecutor. He said, well, why don't you come interview with the Eastern District of Kentucky? I said, absolutely. Didn't know what Kentucky was, but I'll figure it out. And I did. And I remember I, as I left for that interview, I told my wife, I said, honey, do not worry about it. Guys like me, the son of a cab driver, don't get jobs like that. My dad was a cab driver. And anyway, I, I, I interview with Kentucky. Have a great time. Enjoy it. I come back, a multipar offers me a job to become an assistant United States attorney. It was a Tuesday. The next day, a Wednesday, and my wife's not happy about this offer, by the way. The next day, a Wednesday, uh, my wife says, I need to talk to you. I said, what's up? She goes, I'm pregnant with our second child. So I looked at her, and I realized that if I, looked, if I saw that little baby's face, I would never take another risk in my life. So on Thursday, without her permission, I called up the U.S. attorney in the Eastern District of Kentucky and said, I accept the position. Should I answer your question? I did not get her permission. Um, and luckily, my wife is still married to me, but I was in the doghouse for a good couple of years as a result of that. Uh, but yes, so to answer your question, I did not get her permission. She would not have given me permission to leave Houston. Um, and, but hopefully, she now realizes it all kind of worked out. You said at some point you decided that you wanted to be a U.S. attorney. Is, do you have like a memory of what sort of push you over the edge to start looking out and seeking positions that would involve being in the federal government? Absolutely. It, uh, it was a, a very stark moment. So before I became um, an AUSA, you know, I was in the private sector for several years. And I worked at a firm called Winstead, a great law firm. Um, and I thought all I wanted to do when I got out of law school was make as much money as I could uh, and become a partner at a big law firm. Um, when you grow up poor like I did, that's kind of what you want to do. And um, then 9-11 happened. And I realized that people who looked like me or at that time shared my faith 
um, or shared my culture would be would be looked at with eyes jaundiced by the deeds of Muslim terrorists. And so I started to represent people pro bono in um, civil rights cases, um, in civil liberties issues. And so through that process, I got to meet federal prosecutors on the other side. And there were a couple of things that kind of tipped me over the edge. I remember I represented this guy who had been stuck in immigration detention for several years. And I filed a habeas petition on his behalf pro bono. And by this point, I'd left a large law firm and starting my own law firm. And, and But I was still doing, you know, mostly billable work, commercial defense work, but I was doing this stuff on the side. And I took the deposition as part of this habeas petition, the deposition of the deportation officer, the jailer over my client at the time who was stuck in immigration detention. And I asked the deportation officer a question. And if he answered yes to this question during the deposition, um, then under Supreme Court law, my client had to be released. On the other side of the table, the person defending um, the deportation officer was an assistant U.S. attorney. Um, his name is Daniel Hugh. At that time, he was, I think, deputy chief of the civil section. So I take the deposition, and I ask the question of the deportation officer, and the deportation officer said, yes. Now, you got to understand, the civil world, especially in the litigation side, can be quite uncivil. When money's involved, when people are disputing contracts and profits, people get nasty, and they can become quite uncivil. So I was kind of used to an uncivil, civil practice. So I said, Daniel, after the guy said yes, I said, let's go outside I think we need to talk. Let's stop the deposition. So we go outside. And I said, Daniel, you heard what the deportation officer said. Why is my client still in detention? And Daniel looked at me and said, he'll be released tomorrow. And that's when I realized that his practice was different from mine. Right? I was driven by profits. I was driven by billable hours. I was driven by, um, you know, not by mission. All Daniel has to do every day, all he had to do every day when he woke up was to do justice. That, to me, was a tipping point. That's when I said to myself, I think that's something I want to do. I then took on a couple of national security cases on the defense side, and I got to meet the federal prosecutors on the other side. And I realized that every day, and as well as the agents, every day they woke up and all they had to do was do the right thing. There's a famous Supreme Court case called Berger versus United States. 1935, Justice Sutherland delivers the opinion. And, and in this opinion, he talks about the role of the prosecutor. And there was this line that says, while the prosecutor may strike hard blows, in fact, he is expected to do so. He is not at liberty to strike foul ones. And so that's what Daniel did that day, right? He could strike a hard blow, but he's not at liberty to strike a foul one. And the Supreme Court said, he should release my client, and so he did so. And so that is kind of what led me to one day say, you know what, I think I want to be one of those. I want to be a Daniel Hugh. I want to be the federal prosecutor on the other side. And so that's uh, the arc of my career. Otherwise, it's, it's probably unlike others, but that's kind of what led me there. Sounds incredibly rewarding. It is. It is. And, you know, and don't get me wrong, doing uh, civil liberties work was incredibly rewarding as well. Uh, but knowing that I get to wake up every day and just do that. And then on top of all that, um, it, it all became crystal clear when I walked into a courtroom for the very first time as an AUSA in Kentucky. And I said, my name is Alam Hamdani and I represent the United States. I love saying it then. I love saying it now, and it still ch sends chills up and down my spine. Must have been surreal to say that for the first time. You know, it was, especially, you know, uh, as a migrant, it was surreal, um, knowing, you know, and I, I was, uh, you know, and I remember um, becoming a citizen. I was, in 2004, so I was 32 years old when I became a citizen. Judge Hittner, a uh, federal district judge, is the one who presided over that uh, citizenship ceremony, and there was like hundreds of us in this big auditorium, and, you know, to this day, I still remember distinctly uh, how it smelled, all the people in the room, of course, what I said and how I wept afterwards. And 
uh, to put a bookend on that, one of the coolest things I got to do as an AUSA. So Amul Tapar, remember I told you he hired me. He ended up becoming the first South Asian to become a federal district judge. He was a district judge in the Eastern District of Kentucky. And so Amul and I used to do, a Judge Tapar and I, used to do immigration ceremonies. And so I would represent the motion on behalf of the United States that all the people in that room should become citizens, and Judge Tapar would preside over it. So, um, yes, it is a very cool feeling. It's a very cool feeling to be an immigrant to say that. It's a very cool feeling every time when I say I represent the U.S. So much of your career is centered on combating public corruption and promoting national security. Yeah. What was it that prompted your keen focus on these two areas in particular? For sure. So I told you, uh, you know, I... After 9-11, my practice changed, and I realized that people who looked like me or shared my culture or shared my faith at the time would be looked at with eyes jaundiced by the deeds of Muslim terrorists. I realized that there was a desire and a need for somebody uh, to kind of step into that civil liberties and civil rights role. When I did that, I didn't know anything about national security law. When I did that, I didn't know anything about the the intersection between national security issues and civil liberties issues and how the Constitution uh, worked or maybe sometimes didn't work in that regard. And so I taught myself national security issues. I used to debate in open forums. Here at U of H, at Rice, at the law school, I used to debate the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of Texas. So the office I now run, I used to debate those AUSAs on national security issues. And one thing I knew is those guys were whipped wicked smart. So I had to teach myself about national security issues. So that's what kind of led me to do national security issues. Then when I was at the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of Kentucky, about two years in, a position opened up at the counterterrorism section at Maine Justice. To kind of give you guys an idea of how the world of Maine Justice and kind of what we do, and and take even more fundamentally. Uh, At DOJ, we prosecute. That's what we do. Um, The DA's office, they prosecute. The district attorney's office prosecutes state crimes. We prosecute federal crimes. Um, And so that's kind of how what we do and how that's different uh, from from DA's offices. The DOJ, um, some call it the world's largest law firm. Um, It is made up of many different sections. You've got the criminal division, which does criminal work, civil division, which does, guess it, civil work, uh, the antitrust division does antitrust work. Uh, the Solicitor General's office are the Supreme Court advocates on behalf of the president. And then uh, there is the National Security Division, where I worked for five years. And then there are the U.S. Attorney's offices. There's 93 or 94 different U.S. Attorney's offices and 93 different United States attorneys. I'm one of them. Um, and so when I was at the U.S. Attorney's office in the Eastern District of Kentucky, uh, there was a position that opened up at the National Security Division, specifically in the counterterrorism section. Um, and so my boss at the time in Kentucky said, hey, you should look at that position. If you take your prior experience doing national security work on the private side, right, and defending individuals in national security matters, and now take your role as a prosecutor and you marry those up, you might be a good foot the counterterrorism section. And he was right. And so... Um, I spent five years at the counterterrorism section chasing terrorists, um, whether domestically or internationally, working on national security issues for a long time. And then I moved back to Houston uh, almost 10 years ago now, nine years ago, um, to come back to home to Houston um, and to become a federal process, to become an AUSA again. Um, And through that process, I, I took on public corruption issues. And so that's how I ended up kind of working both public corruption and national security issues. But I'd say for 13 of my 16 years at DOJ, it's been, I've been chasing terrorists and spies. It's exciting, but I'll tell you, I just, as much as I enjoy doing that work, I loved going after, you know, um, those who committed gun crimes, those who committed uh, drug crimes, going after, you know, uh, those who committed, you know, violence um, in violation of federal law. So there's, the great thing about working at the DOJ and working, do, doing federal prosecutions and working at a U.S. attorney's office is you can do all of that and you can kind of, you know, you, you help society out in many different ways. So how have you started helping society out um, as you, in your role as the, the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Texas? How has that changed since you were an assistant in that same office? Yeah, no, so, you know, now I set um, hopefully the priorities of the office. Uh, and I think the best way I can kind of set the priorities of the office is, is how I run the office. 
So I run the office according to what I call the mama rule. My mama. She is 80 years old and she lives on a fixed income. She represents the people we protect in the Southern District of Texas. So the Southern District of Texas is made up of several offices. You've got the Houston office. You've got uh, McAllen, Laredo, Brownsville, Galveston, Corpus Christi, and Victoria. Uh, we, in the Southern District of Texas, also have 400 miles of border with Mexico. And within that Southern District of Texas, we have 9 million people we are charged with protecting. So as the U.S. attorney, I set the vision. I set the vision according to what I call the mama rule. And what my mo mother was, represents are the crimes that we prosecute and the victims that we protect. For example, my mother is a migrant. She is often the victim of human smuggling operations where tractor trailers turn over and people are killed. Uh, my mother represents uh, the victims of human trafficking. Oftentimes, human smuggling will turn into human trafficking, such as sex trafficking, such as labor trafficking. Um, my mother represents, uh, she lives in a community that is has been destroyed by drug trafficking. Remember, we have 400 miles of border with Mexico. This is cartel country. The, you know, uh, the Sinaloa cartel, the, the Jalisco New Generation cartel, the cartel del Norte, the Gulf cartel, they're all um, just on the other side of my offices. And they are pushing drugs and human trafficking up across that border. Gun trafficking goes across that border into Mexico from here in the Southern District of Texas. And guns, of course, are the, uh, the tools of violent gangs. And the violent gangs, whether you're in the Fifth Ward or Sunnyside, they destroy neighborhoods, but in the crossfire of that violent crime are people like my mother. Public corruption, when they take money out of the coffers, right? they're taking money, those public officials, they're taking money out of my mother's pocket. You know, this is the medical center. This is the center of the medical center. And so Medicare fraud is a big deal. When fraud happens, especially Medicare fraud, it takes money out of my mother's pocket. You know, Indian call centers, those scam centers that we all talk about, the victims of that are the elderly like my mother. And even on the national security side, right? China, Russia, and Iran, they are, you know, prevalent throughout here, and there are big national security concerns related to that. You know, not, those national security threaten the national security of my mother. So my mother represents the people we protect. So the, 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 the priorities are all of that. On top of that, there was the U.S. attorney, much so less when I was in the U.S. As U.S. attorney, I set the tone of how we treat each other in this office. The mama rule also dictates that. We will treat each other in my office within the Southern District of Texas, 220 federal prosecutors, 410 employees. We treat each other like we would treat our own mother, with respect, like a family. But even more than that, we'll treat defense counsel with that same kind of respect. Remember how I said, as federal prosecutors, we may strike hard blows, but we are not liberty to strike foul ones. That means we, when we walk into a courtroom, are held to the highest of standards. Judges look to us to always tell them the truth, even though the truth may not be may not be beneficial for our case. Um, and then on top of that, oh yeah, before we bring charges, we understand that when we touch the shoulder of a potential defendant, that defendant's life is going to go spiraling out of control. You know, especially in a criminal case. And so again. Our, our prosecutors, I tell them to use discretion. For example, with Daniel Hugh, at the end of the day, if the right thing to do is to release the defendant, right, you do that. Or we'll release the migrant, you do that. Or if the right thing to do is to seek life, you will do that as well. So hopefully that kind of, so I set the tone, I set what we do, I set how we treat each other. I imagine it must give you a tremendous sense of purpose, being on the front line of all these incredibly important issues in a district that's larger than many states. It does. It does. And I'll tell you, um, I think I said earlier, this is the greatest job I will ever have. It is because of that. Um, you know, I, I still get up before my alarm because I'm so excited about going into the office. Um, and I'm constantly thinking about... Uh, the people I'm responsible for, not only the 9 million people in this district, but the 410 people every day who come on, you know, set for that mission of doing justice, the public servants that I am uh, responsible for, their lives, their happiness. You know, as one of your constituents, it feels great to have someone so enthusiastic about his office as you. Thanks, man. Up there, you know, pr prosecuting the bad guys. I appreciate it. It is, it is a, a great gig. It is a gift. Yeah. 
Would you mind telling us a little bit about your uh, nomination and confirmation process as well sure. and how you obtained the office? Sure, sure, sure. So um, first of all, though, before, before putting my name into the hat, I had to give myself permission, which is a tough thing to do sometimes, right? You know, I am uh, I'm, I'm, I'm of South Asian origin. Uh, my daddy was a cab driver. I don't have a whole bunch of connections. Um, and so part of it was giving myself permission to say, you know what, I think maybe you could become the U.S. attorney. I mean, think about it, right? I was an AUSA in the office for a while. And who am I to say I can become presidentially appointed and Senate confirmed that I, I should be the one leading, you know, the 400 people within the Southern District. But luckily for me, I had a multipar. So a multipar hired me. A multipar exists. Because he exists, I had to give my, I gave myself permission to say, you know what, I can do it. And if you look at the Southern District of Texas, um, if you go to the reception area um, of the Southern District, you'll see a wall. And on that wall are all the former UN, United States attorneys in the Southern District of Texas. And except for an African-American woman, um, from the early 1990s, everybody else looks the same, and they don't look like me. Um, but because of a multipar, I said, you know what, maybe I can do this. And so how does it look like? The process, there's no guidebook for the process. There's no, this is what you do next. Uh, the process involved a lot of interviews with a lot of different committees, uh, and including uh, what is known as uh, the Federal Judicial Evaluation Committee, which is the committee of Senators Cornyn and Cruz. And so they had a committee um, that vetted candidates. So I, I put in my application there, as well as with like uh, different congresspersons like uh, um, Sylvia Garcia, Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia had a committee, and, and, and so did uh, Congress, um, Congresswoman Sheila, uh, Sheila Jackson Lee and Congresswoman Lizzie Fletcher and, and Congressman um, um, Al Green. They all had committees. Uh, now, the Federal Judicial Evaluation Committee for Cornyn and Cruz is probably the most formal one. Here's what ended up happening. They vetted me, and I was one of three people they decided to interview as a committee. And if you can imagine, uh, we're in a conference room, uh, a conference room about, about this size with 30 uh, people around this conference table, many of them former United States attorneys. Many of them, I think three of them were Four of them were former Texas Supreme Court justices. Uh, you've got, you know, some of the most high-powered lawyers in, in Texas. And you had 30 minutes with these 30 people. And uh, it was probably the most nerve-wracking uh, interview I had. And I probably spent hours, many hours, prepping for these 30 minutes. Uh, but luckily, I made it out. So what they did is they picked one person uh, to go interview with the two United States senators after that. Um, and, and luckily, I was the one they chose. And then I met uh, with Senators Cruz and Cornyn, um, had a very uh, wonderful kind of interviews with them. And then uh, you, here's what you do. You hurry up and wait. And that's what I did. I hurry up and wait. And it took several more months. And then finally, uh, the president nominated me to become the United States Attorney, um, and then uh, the Senate uh, thankfully confirmed me soon soon thereafter. Um, and so that's the process. But the process itself, it depends on the state. This My process took a couple of years uh, to get through uh, from, 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 from initially saying I'm interested to uh, getting confirmed by the Senate. How did that moment feel when you found out that it was all official, that you had finally obtained your goal? What, what was that moment like for you? I remember it was uh, it was five five thirty on a Friday afternoon, uh, and it was December sixth, two thousand and twenty two, um, and remember I told you there's that wall of photos, right? Mm -hmm. So I went downstairs and I found my photo; it had already been framed, and uh, the two security guards were the only people left in the office. And I remember I took that photo and I hung it up on the wall. And as I hung it up on the wall, several things, several emotions went through me. Uh, probably the most important one was uh, I felt the weight of the expectations of all the people that got me there. So that two years, I called on people I'd known 20 years ago to 20 minutes ago to say, help, help me. I'm, you know, I'm this son of a cab driver, I probably need your help. And luckily for me, there was a lot of people who were willing to help and help me get to that position. 
And so I felt the weight of their expectations as I, as I uh, hung up that photo. But also, I also felt underneath me uh, their shoulders lifting me up. Um, and so it was an incredibly surreal moment. Uh, but also, at that moment, I was like, okay, I cannot mess this up. I gotta do it right. And so that's, that's uh, kind of how I felt. And of course, I was incredibly excited. And, and, uh, and I thought of my father. You know, he wasn't there with us that day, but I was hoping he was looking down. So given your prior experience as a U.S. attorney, or uh, as a first assistant, or as an assistant U.S. attorney, yeah. sorry, yeah. Um, you, you likely had a decent idea of what it took to be the U.S. attorney at that time, correct? I did. I, I had a, I, the good thing for me is I'd been in federal practice at the DOJ for, at that point, 15 or so years. So that was helpful. I didn't know what it was like to be the United States attorney. Uh, but, you know, it's, so I'll tell you this, DOJ is full of TLAs, three-letter acronyms. So is the government, right? And so at least I could understand and appreciate kind of how the different parts of government worked, especially because I spent five years at Maine Justice in Washington, D.C. So I knew the importance of that relationship as well. So given that prior experience, what was, after nearly a year in office, what's been your biggest surprise uh, so far? Easy, easy. That's uh, So, you know, you've been on law review, right? Um, and when you've been, you've done a sight check, you've been up all night, you've kind of, you know, and the folks on, on the board, these are people that you would ride and die with, right? These are people you have worked with, but there's not... But you don't get along with everybody. It is just a natural course of being a human being. And so that was me, right? So there were some folks who, you know, I, I got to know over those years. And some of them, you know, maybe uh, I didn't get along with uh, quite as much. And so, you know, I, I remember thinking to myself, okay, when I become the U.S. attorney, you know, I'm going to make some changes. I'll tell you this. The moment you sit in that chair, the moment you sit into that big chair, I saw the folks, especially even the ones that I didn't get along with, in a wholly different light. When you are now responsible for the lives and the happiness and the mission of 400 individuals, you see them differently. You see them as your responsibility. And so now, that was the most surprising thing, is the moment I sat in that chair, every one of them became my responsibility. Just think about it, their salary, their happiness, uh, their sense of mission um, is on me. And so that's probably the most surprising thing is like how that just at the switch changes. It's interesting that it came on so quickly, that it wasn't a gradual process, just the moment you sat down, your yeah. perspective changed so quickly. It, it, you know, it, it really is. And, 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 and I would say this, hopefully it's because I view this job um, as a privilege and I view working with this group as a privilege. I also know, you know, my shelf life in being the U.S. attorney um, is going to be much shorter than any of their careers. And so I've only got a short amount of time to do the right thing. So kind of, you have to quickly, so that's why probably my, my, my perspective changed so quickly. So like Jake said, now that you're almost a year mm -hmm. into, you know, into your new role, what would you say the most challenging part of your role as U.S. attorney is? And then in a similar vein, what would you say the most rewarding aspect is? Yeah, I think the cha most challenging part is just as much as I care about the people uh, within this district and within the Southern District of Texas that work um, under my leadership. It's, it's the, the, the toughest thing is sometimes making the personnel decisions that you have to make and the changes you have to make. And, and so that's always hard. It is the diff most difficult part is is making a change that maybe somebody doesn't want to make, but you, as the U.S. attorney, you know, make that change for a variety of reasons. Um, the most rewarding thing about my job is I get to brag about the people um, in this office. Um, I get to talk about what they do, and I get to hopefully give them the resources um, and, again, the sense of mission uh, that they get to do. So, you know, if you... Uh, probably more so than uh, prior U.S. attorneys, I've taken advantage of my platform, and so I try to talk about what we do. I'm pretty forward-leaning um, on the press, just being a great example, right? I'm here. Um, I want people to know what we do in this office um, and the good that we do in this office. Um, you know, I, for the longest time, had met an AUSA even until I was a lawyer for several years, never mind the U.S. attorney. 
And so I want people to know that, you know, uh, we don't sit in an ivory tower, and this is what we do every day, and this is what, you know, the folks in my office do every day to make your lives um, better and to give you the security you want. So the Southern District of Texas encompasses a population and geographic area that is larger than some states, as mm -hmm. we mentioned earlier. Yeah. You know, with such a large jurisdiction, you must frequently encounter situations in which a criminal defendant violates both federal and state law simultaneously. Yeah. Um, would you please provide some insight regarding the types of factors you consider when deciding whether or not you want to prosecute that individual under federal law or let state authorities handle that? And if so, um, how do you uh, combine or work with state officials? So we're all guided, not only, of course, by what I said from uh, Burger versus United States, but we're also all guided uh, by, the, uh, by the principles of federal prosecution. You can find it online at DOJ. And the principles of federal prosecution were drafted um, in the early 1980s, I believe, by then A.G. Civiletti. Um, and a young, by the way, he had a young staffer uh, named Merrick Garland at the time who worked on his, he was part of his staff. And, 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 and A.G. Garland will tell you that, um, uh, you know, he was proud of being part of this. So the principles of federal prosecution tell us that we have, you know, we have discretion as federal prosecutors and we look at the resources of the office and the priorities of the office and we'll make decisions as to whether um, it's appropriate to bring a federal prosecution at a particular time. Long way to say is we look at each case, each case individually when bringing a federal prosecution. Um, and we also look at the needs and the issues within the district. So, for example, cartels, fentanyl, right? Those are things that are priority, not only of the nation, but certainly of this district. Um, you know, going after those who commit civil rights violations are a priority of this office. Uh, going after national security issues, China, Russia, and Iran are big priorities of this office. So we're going to be, you know, looking that and, and looking at our resources and go, you know, can we prosecute those cases and how can we prosecute them? How can we staff them? Oftentimes, as you said, there is concurrent jurisdiction with the state authorities. And so we'll work with the state authorities and we'll determine, is this a case best uh, for the state to go to or is this a case where federal prosecutions should maybe uh, do it? And we'll look at, uh, for example, the facts of the case. And this is something we always do. We follow the facts and the law. We'll look at the facts of the case. We'll look at, for example, um, what uh, a federal prosecution would bring maybe as it relates to how much prison time somebody should get. Um, you know, will this will this give the will will the state prosecution provide the, the adequate amount of deterrence uh, as opposed to a federal prosecution? Does it give um, the victims uh, justice as opposed to a federal prosecution? So, we'll look at all that things, and then we'll we'll, we'll be in conversation with the uh, the state authorities to make sure as to what the best route is. Hopefully, that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And so, at the end of your tenure as the United States Attorney for the Southern District of Texas. When you look back at the end of your term at all you've accomplished, what's the one thing that you most want to be able to tell yourself? That in every decision I made, uh, whether it's, you know, uh, something relating to the budget or whether it's uh, something relating to uh, the approval of a particular prosecution, that I always did the right thing. That's it. If I can stay with that North Star uh, of doing the right thing, um, and I've always done it, then I would be happy with my time um, as the United States Attorney, and I'm hopeful that I will leave this district in better shape uh, than when I found it. That is a beautiful guiding principle. Is that kind of the same thing you would tell any young lawyer listening to this podcast Absolutely. Right now? You know, whether you're in civil practice, in private civil practice, or whether you're uh, at the DOJ, you know, as lawyers, um, you know, we are public servants um, to the community that we are a part of. Whether you're public servants by by salary as a as a DOJ employee, or whether uh, you're a public servant working for a large New York law firm, uh, you're still a public servant to the community you're a part of. And so, you know, always tell the truth, always do the right thing, um, no matter what your client may think they want to do, always give them uh, clear-headed uh, advice with that North Star of always doing the right thing. Well, it's clear to me that you embody those principles incredibly well, um, just from the interactions that I've had with you. And it, it's you're just a public servant at heart is what I'm gathering. I am. I am. And, you know, it, it, it breaks my heart, that same heart. Uh, it breaks my heart knowing that one day I'm probably going to have to leave 
uh, the, the U.S. Attorney's Office and DOJ. But uh, until then, I'm going to savor every moment. Well, we've savored every moment of this time with us <laughs> today. Uh, thank you so much for your time, U.S. Attorney. Hey, man, thanks for all you do. And uh, as you know, I'm a former I'm a Law Review alumni of the Houston Law Review, so I am thankful that uh, the Law Review is in, is in great hands, and I know it will be in great hands for years to come. Thanks, guys. Yes, sir. Thank really you appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thanks for listening. Emphasis Added is a podcast brought to you by the Houston Law Review. If you like what you see, check us out on Spotify, YouTube, or your favorite podcast streaming app for new content when it drops. Follow us on Instagram at Emphasis Added Pod, or check out the Law Review at HoustonLawReview.org.